Broadcasting from the KMF Collective Studio, it's time for the Athletes of the Titan Games podcast. This limited release show features the stories of the 2020 contestants of Dwayne The Rock Johnson's athletic competition, NBC's The Titan Games. Now, here's your host, Katie Galley. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Season 2, Episode 16 of the Athletes of the Titan Games podcast. I'm your host, Katie Galley. In the KMF Collective studio with me today, I have Titan Games athlete, U.S. Air Force K-9 vet, LW strongman competitor, and manager of public grants at Montgomery County Community College, Andrew Hannes. How are you doing, Andrew? Great, great, Katie. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. Of course. Thank you so much for stopping by and sharing your story with us today. Yeah, yeah. I should have given you a heads up that LW is, stands for lightweight. Oh, I... <laughs> That's good. I sound a little silly. LW stands. That's good to know. Lightweight. Well, I'm excited to to learn more about what that means um, in the realm of, for you, of strongman competitor then. Um, so, Andrew, then, um, for you, uh, coming from this background of athletics, I wonder, where did you grow up? And then how was your uh, childhood, if at all, shaped by athletics? How was my childhood shaped by athletics? Oh, wow. Um, well, growing up, I kind of, up until about sixth grade, I moved around a lot every year, actually, until sixth grade. Yeah. Um, and then I settled down, my family settled down in a small town called Manaway, Ohio. And that's where I graduated from high school. I went to a very, very small school, uh, only 250 students in my graduating class. Wow. And through high school, I played, you know, even middle school and through high school, I played, um, football did wrestling and of course ran track probably my favorite sport and um that's i mean in a very very quick nutshell that is like my youth activities wrapped up yeah and i get that i mean track's my favorite sport too running's the best so i get it so it's the best sport Mm -hmm. ever (laughs) yeah (laughs) <laughs> um, so Andrew, from there, I mean, having your childhood at a young age shaped by athletics and getting involved in all these different sports, um, how did that kind of shape you looking into the next level? And how did you ultimately um, become a member of the U.S. Air Force? Yeah, well, honestly, there there was no next level of athletics for me after high school. Yeah. Um, actually, into my senior year, I stopped playing in all team sports altogether. Um, and I, I really had no idea where I was going or what I was doing. So, um, tried to do the normal, like, okay, go out, find a job, start going to college. No idea what I was going to college for. I dropped out of community college, actually, uh, the first semester I was there. Yeah. (laughs) Um, had no idea what I was doing. And actually one of my really good friends, he was looking to join the Coast Guard, and I was like, no, nah, man, don't join the Coast Guard. You know, Air Force is the way to go. And the only reason I was biased to the Air Force was I had some friends that were in. My my great-grandfather uh, was an Air Force veteran. And so, uh, you know, we went down to the recruiting office together, and somehow I ended up signing paperwork, too. And... <laughs> few months later we we both shipped off uh to boot camp and that was in actually in 2009 wow and uh so yeah there were some things that we had to do to like to get physically prepared for uh just general pt standards in the air force which are not very strict um or or crazy i mean it's a mile and a half run it's push-ups and sit-ups in a minute and that was the gist of it um so you know if you're in decent shape, you should be able to get a, a good score, right, on an Air Force PT st- PT test. Mm-hmm. Um, the nice thing is, is just like in any of the armed services and just, of course, on any team or any sport that you get involved in, once you're in and if you have a competitive mindset, you know, you kind of flick it on. And everything from that point on, especially in the physical kind of domain, was all about okay, how do I, how do I beat the next guy? How do I get to the top? How do I become the best? Right. Um, and even when you weren't the best at something, it's like, okay, I will never have a five minute mile, but I'll be, you know, damned if I'm not going to try to, you know, best this person at at something else. Mm. Um, and so that's just kind of the nature of 
I think any kind of competitive, you know, especially in the fitness industry, uh, but any kind of competitive domain that you, you step foot into. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, wanting to be the best version of yourself, wanting to compete and be better than others. And so, Andrew, once you yeah. um, decided you wanted to take that step forward and um, enlist in the Air Force, how did you find yourself in the K-9 unit? Yeah, that's uh, it's kind of funny, actually. I, I never even when I was in, uh, signing my paperwork away, I never had any kind of um, idea or insights that there were canine units in the air force yeah lo and behold the air force actually manages the entire dod uh military working dog program wow so (laughs) that was a really fun fact and i learned that after i i got out of boot camp and i went to our technical training school you know it's almost like eight months later i get to my first duty station and my first night i show up for work and we go to guard mount briefing and we're all standing in, in formation and you know an officer walks in with a dog i'm like why why does he have a dog i was really confused <laughs> um and so i got to i got to meet that individual that night and from there it was just kind of like that's what i want to do mm-hmm. uh so i worked with the kennels and this was i was stationed in north carolina at the time and worked with the kennels there they they helped to you know build my package to go on to canine school uh where eventually um i became canine handler and so it's along the way you know there's a lot of things that you have to do that every every military career has certain milestones um learning objectives that you have to you know you have to meet these standards you have to meet these learning outcomes in order to progress um so of course you know i had to do all of those other things prior to becoming a canine handler and you know, along the way, there there were other missions, there were deployments, there's different assignments that you get. So it does take some time to actually get in, but that's okay because at least when I went through, you couldn't just go straight to being a canine handler. You actually had to do um, a little bit of time in in the standard, what they call straight leg world, um, to, to, to earn the right to go to those specialized schools. Um, and so, yeah, I'll leave it, I'll leave it there for for a moment. And so, um, what made you decide, I mean, you said you, you kind of, uh, had the realization, um, about you could be a canine handler and be part of this division. Um, what made you decide, I want to go forward with this. I want to put in the work and and put in all this time, um, to pursue becoming, um, be, being a part of the canine unit. Yeah. So, um, honestly, it's, it was kind of. It was, uh, well, not only was it a challenge in itself, mm-hmm. um, but, but working with dogs is just, it's an amazing and rewarding experience, right? So I don't know if you, if you grew up with dogs, um, but I certainly yeah. did. We always, we always had dogs. And so it's just something that I was like, man, that would just be really awesome. Um, and the more I got involved and, you know, when you're trying to get the approval to go to canine school, you have to do a lot of the dirty work. Um, so you're feeding the dogs, you're cleaning out their kennels, you know, scrubbing the floors, uh, all these things. And it's things like that that really, really make you appreciate, you know, what these dogs um, bring to just the value that they bring to the, the service in general, but also the value that they bring to the unit and their individual handlers. And I think that that was something that was very intrinsic that kind of built up over time. And really, you know, I just became devoted after a good while. Even when I would deploy, I, I would link up with the, the, the kennel section uh, overseas. And, you know, we would go out and we would do trainings at 3 a.m. And we would do bite work and we would do scent work and things like that. And I would help out and, and learn the ropes well before I ever went to canine school. Wow. Uh, and it's just something that, yeah, it really grows a part of your character. Um, and once you're in it, you're in it. Mm-hmm. Man, I love that though. And it's, um, like you said, I mean, you grew up with dogs and so you had that, that relationship and, uh, you know, Mm -hmm. being able to pursue that in a professional way, um, that really is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. It was great. It was. So I did that for a handful of years. Yeah. And so then after that, Andrew, um, what was the next step for you? So after, um, how long were you in the air force working in the canine unit? And then what, um, what kind of happened next after that came to a close? Um, well, a lot of things happened. <laughs> um, 
So, yeah, I, um, I was a canine handler out at Travis Air Force Base in California, and my military working dog and partner, who is now retired, his name is Benny, oh. and he just retired in January of 2020. Wow. So he lived a, he, he has been working for a long time. He's lived a, a good working life, and now he is at um, a place in Texas called the Warrior Dog Foundation, mm -hmm. uh, going through rehabilitation. So the potential is, hope, the hopeful potential is that uh, we'll be able to adopt him and bring him home here. Uh, but of course, there are a whole lot of other things that, you know, they have to look for. Like, can he actually live in a home with another dog, with another human who is not a handler? Uh, things of that nature, right? You know, what are his tics? What set them off? Because some, many, many of these dogs, um, especially years ago, when they were deemed not suitable for adoption, they would, of course, put them down. Wow. Uh, and so, luckily, at, since I've gotten out, actually, the uh, the founder of this Warrior Dog Foundation, he's a, a prior Navy SEAL, and he used to train canines while in the military as well. And he started this foundation in order to help save these dogs, because these dogs don't deserve to be put down. Right. So, you know, it was it's a pretty big deal for, for dogs like Benny, um, who, okay, they get a second chance. And, you know, if, if it comes out at the end of the day that it's not suitable for Benny to come home with me, that's okay because he still has a home there or potentially with another individual who has, uh, you know, a, a more appropriate lifestyle and environment where he can live out the rest of his days. Um, and so I totally forgot where I was going. I just start talking about Benny. <laughs> No, That's I love it. it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Benny sounds great, and I love it. I we were talking about how um you know you were part of the uh, canine unit um and oh, helped yeah, kind yeah. of like you know right, where right. the path you were taking, and then yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So um well, it was actually a very critical point in my career, and I I had to make a decision of whether or not to reenlist and go for you know another stint in the Air Force. Um, or do I get out? Do I go to school? Do I move to, uh, at the time where my wife had lived in Phoenix and, you know, kind of do the civilian thing. So needless to say, I, I chose to, to get out and went to school using my, my GI Bill, um, went to school at Arizona State University, got my undergrad at, in science and technology policy with kind of the hopes that like, okay, maybe I'll go back and I'll work for the DOD and I'll do something cool. And I mean, I really had no idea where I was going with it. All I knew was, you know, it's just education as a next step. Mm -hmm. So did the school thing, um, ended up getting tasked with a, um, a really cool academic kind of opportunity that was in DC. And while I was there, it was required for me to have an internship and I ended up getting a very, very golden opportunity to have an internship at the White House under the Obama administration. Wow. So, I, yeah, it was it was cool. I ended up uh, spending a few months there as an intern in the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And uh, I, apparently I did good. Um, so <laughs> the work I did was well was well received. They decided to bring me back on as a science policy fellow. Wow. So I, I stayed there um, for uh, almost another year. And the whole time I was in D.C., you know, my wife, she's in the she's in the midst of actually relocating to Atlanta for a job. So it's like, OK, the administration's coming to a close. My my contract as a fellow is coming to an end. I'm moving to Atlanta now. What's in Atlanta? What do I do with myself? I don't know. I can just keep going to school because I still have all these GI Bill yeah. uh, benefits that I can use. So I decided to apply to some schools for graduate um, programs, and I got into the Georgia Institute of Technology. Yeah. And it was oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. My I I live in Atlanta, and my brother and my dad and my sister went to Georgia Tech. So. <laughs> oh yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> that's wonderful. Yeah. You know, and so you know, it's a it's a really it's an amazing school, probably one of the top schools in the South, um, mm -hmm. one of the top schools on the East Coast. And I was kind of mind blown because I'm like, I am not smart enough to be here. So. <laughs> Uh, you know, I got accepted into uh, actually two master's programs there, the city planning, as well as the public policy program. Wow. So 
it took me three years, but I graduated uh, from tech with two master's degrees. And <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, right. And so this is where it gets even more amusing. So in the midst of like my last semester, my wife took uh, another job up in the Philadelphia area. Sure, of course. <laughs> and so uh, I finished, you know, I finished graduate school and I moved up to Philadelphia. And here I am. Um, you know, a year later, I've been here and I started working uh, just last fall for a community college, uh, which is right down the road from me. It's a very, very cool community college, Montgomery County Community College. And um, I'm the grants manager for all the public uh, funding that that school receives. So, you know, it's it's been a crazy ride since the Air Force, and yeah. I've had so many neat experiences uh, within each of those little nodes of uh, or those chapters along the way uh, that's kind of, you know, brought me to where I am today. Man, and I mean, seriously, from being in the Air Force and then um, being working for the White House and the Obama administration and then <laughs> going to get two master's degrees. I mean, why not? You know, and just, yeah, <laughs> just of course, at- why not? You know, like <laughs> this, is, a- I, this is also the same guy who barely, Pat, you know, graduated from high school, barely graduated from high school, dropped out of community college when I was 18. I mean, I was going nowhere and all, all out of, you know, a lot of things happened to kind of light a fire um and so yeah it's just kind of you know taking that will and that drive and actually doing something with it my gosh but what kind of testament is that you know i mean you <laughs> to have truly i mean to almost failing out of high school not finishing community college but then look what you've accomplished i mean it's it's mm-hmm. like you said it's about that will and that drive and the determination what are you going to do with what you have and so you just right. pushed through i i mean it's it's seriously incredible so are you going to go get like a third and fourth master's degree now just for fun <laughs> I'm actually in the midst of considering my PhD in astrophysics. Of course you are. Of course you are. <laughs> Man, that's cool. <laughs> and uh, so, Andrew, then, I mean, with this truly amazing um, path that you've led, how did you um, now with this um, job that you have being uh, the pu- doing public grants at the Montgomery County Community College, how did this position come up? Because is it it's not related to science and technology, really, right? Right. No, it is not actually. Um, and what's a little bit challenging is like, like you just said, like this does not align with with I with what I actually went to school for. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's okay because one of the other really nice things is while I was at the White House, um, and also of course throughout my entire graduate program, a lot of experience I uh, that I had was around writing grants, managing grants, how to develop new programs um, or new pilot programs, different types of initiatives. Um, and so I, I gained a lot of insight on both sides of grant management. And so it was just kind of like, you know, I'm looking along for jobs once I moved to this area. And when I saw this pop up, I'm like, oh, I can, I can do this. Yeah. Um, you know, it's kind of an easy fit. It, but like you said, it doesn't align with the science and technology side of things. And so that's where, you know, even as I took this position, I, you know, communicated with the college, you know, with the, the directors that, you know, there are some things that I would like to explore and they seem open minded to it. So we'll see where this job takes me. I love that. I mean, his, you're right. And it doesn't have to be exactly aligned with what, you know, this path that you're on, but it's definitely something that's related to things you've done. Yeah. And so it can still progress yep. you. And so Andrew, then of course, like you said, you're considering getting your PhD. So then where do you see yourself? What goals do you have for your career path? Where do you see yourself headed? <laughs> well, and so that's part of the thing too, is, is, as, as I'm exploring this PhD option, I, I have learned, especially spending all that time in tech, um, how just demanding and draining that experience can be um, mm-hmm. that pursuit of, of their doctorate. And so before I even apply uh, to a college for that, I, I'm, I'm trying to home in on what I will actually do my dissertation on. What am I actually most interested in exploring? You know, it can be something from, you know, you know, astrobiology to trying to help understand some of the, the, um, the mysteries around black holes. I mean, it could go on and on. So there's just so much out there 
and really, I think, narrowing down what I'm going to do first is the most important step. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, there, there's going to be... Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say that'll also help me identify like what college is best for me. Yeah, that makes sense. So you have to decide the next step you actually want to take. And so then that will dictate, okay, the best place to take that next step is going to be wherever. Exactly. Exactly. And maybe, maybe after I'm all said and done, that isn't the best step. You know, maybe I just, you know, don't go for any more schooling. <laughs> right. Maybe. Yeah, that's true. And I mean, there's, again, though, that would still clearly that would still not stop you from making progress forward because you would figure out the next way, even if it's not continuing that education. And so Andrew, then too, um, you clearly being the LW strongman, lightweight strongman competitor, (laughs) always something that you you've done. So is that, um, how did you discover then doing strongman competitions in tandem with all this immense amount of schoolwork and studying and this (laughs) career that you were, that you're on? (laughs) Um, I, I, (laughs) <laughs> I don't know how I balanced any of it. Honestly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's kind of funny. My when I first joined the military, right? Like you, you start doing all of these other extracurricular physical activities, um, and I don't know. One thing led to the next, where it's like, okay, you get back in the gym and you start getting after it, um, and you start to understand like you start to build at least an appreciation for like some of the physical demands of the the special forces teams, your green berets, your Rangers, things like that. And so you always aspire to be that, you know, to, to get to the next level, the next echelon, whatever that might be in, in your own mind. Mm -hmm. And um, so I found myself training a lot more at the gym. And while I was doing all that, you know, getting deployed, I, was exposed to powerlifting meets for the first time. And I'm like, what the heck is a powerlifting meet? You know, I had no, I was like 21 years old, never seen a powerlifting meet. First yeah. time I see it is in the middle of a, a, a tent downrange, you know, <laughs> it's kind of like what in the world's going on? But I got it. I got involved and I, I was interested, you know, my also, also my very first CrossFit exposure was, you know, downrange and it ended terribly. I remember just, <laughs> nuking everywhere Mm. and that was in 2010 and so you know like all these kind of fringe type sports started popping up and I was like well this is cool I'm gonna start to explore some of these and as I was um preparing for uh, a powerlifting meet back at the local gold's gym uh individuals were you know they were noticing they're like hey for a little guy you're kind of strong you should you should try this strongman contest i'm like what the heck is strongman like right just another thing to add to the i don't know what this is you know uh, pot yeah so um i got involved and i was like wow this is actually really cool i enjoy this i was terrible at it but (laughs) you know one thing that was really that i really enjoyed was not only did i just have to be you know really, really strong at maximal lifts, but I I also had to be agile and have a little bit of aerobic capacity to do the movements or the medleys that they had laid out or pull the truck, right? Things like that, um, that are exhausting, right? So it was was a really good balance of um, just brute power and and also kind of cap- helped me capitalize on some of my old track abilities, right? So I was a sprinter mm-hmm. and I couldn't really ever do anything past the 400. Like that was just my cap. That was it. Um, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't operate at 410 meters. I was, no, I was done there. <laughs> I feel that. I feel that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I was really fast. Mm-hmm. And so um, just having a lot of power helps in the strongman sport. And so um, I even took time while I was exploring strongman. I did a bodybuilding contest and I looked terrible on stage. I felt like, you know, it was one of those things, though, that, you know, you just checked off the box. So I felt really great uh, about the entire experience, Um, even though I didn't perform that well, because let's just be honest, I had no idea what I was doing. (laughs) Uh, And that's also the other thing that's really nice is with strongman, you don't have to have a lot of knowledge, a lot of insight. You can just get involved, you know, as long as you do it safely, Mm -hmm. um, you can get involved at a number of different levels and start to experience what it is to, you know, make these big lifts or things like that. So anyways, um, after years of competing, 
you know, and I got out of the, uh, the military. I didn't compete for a while. Actually, while I was in DC, I never, the whole year I was there, I never stepped foot into a gym at all. Wow. Um, didn't touch a barbell, but what I did was I, I ran around the park and made friends actually at the park. <laughs> um, were they dogs? Was, no, they were not dogs. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, they were just, they were just random individuals who were doing pull-ups and push-ups and playing on the parallel bars and things like that. And so, yeah. you know, I spent a year doing those kind of calisthenic workouts and things like that. And so, um, you know, all along the way, like my athletic kind of journey has just been very, very haphazard. You know, I spent a year or two doing CrossFit. I had my level one certification. Um, but even while I was doing CrossFit, I was more or less doing strongman and powerlifting in the CrossFit gym. Like I was that one guy, but I was also that one guy where, you know, people would come to me for, you know, advice and insights. Uh, and that's where I really started picking up a coaching mentality, at least, a, you know, in, in that type of atmosphere. Mm -hmm. and um yeah and then from there you know I just stopped competing for a while I had a few surgeries um just didn't really get back into it and then in 2017 I just said screw it like you know I'm now in graduate school things in my life are stable for once in years why not just jump back into it and found the next closest uh, strongman contest and I, I jumped on it and I've been, you know, competing a lot, probably about 10 times a year wow. ever since 2017 and uh, having a ton of fun, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, a ton of fun. And, and that's I, really it. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I mean, having finding that outlet and loving the athletic side because you had like you said, you had such a rigorous life, everything you were learning and studying and pursuing that passion. But then on the side, finding your passion for strongman and lifting and being mm -hmm. physically fit. And so, um, Andrew, then oh, for yeah. you, how did these kind of come together and ultimately lead you to today, this um, opportunity that you had to be a contestant on season two of the Titan Games? Oh, man. Um, it's kind of funny, actually, if there's so many ways I can like, look at this too. Um, <laughs> so I was in Atlanta, right. I'm like suffering through grad school and I had, you know, I had a history of finding everywhere I went, I always found the closest CrossFit gym because it's just as an open kind of platform, um, you know, training space or a box or whatever you want to call it. Uh, you know, they're it's just always very easy for them to accommodate visitors. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when I'm looking for an outlet because I'm not prepared to fail the exam that I have next week, you know, and I need to just vent a little bit, uh, you know, you go find a gym. Yeah. Well, when I moved to Atlanta, uh, I went and I found the, the closest gym to me, uh, which was CrossFit Identity. And I, I walked in there and I said, and, you know, there's just the owners in there. And I said, hey, uh, I, I'm not really a CrossFitter. I can do it, but I'm not a CrossFitter. I, I'm a strongman competitor. Do you mind if I lift in your gym? And they're like, yeah, just don't disrupt class. <laughs> <All> right, <cool. laughs> um, and so I spent three years, right, lifting a CrossFit identity in the back. I had ended up by the end of it. By the time I left, you know, I had strongman um, 101 classes every week. I mean, wow. really had brought a following uh, out of the, the standard gym uh members right and so one of the the gym members that was there one of the gym members wives um did i say that right i, I don't i don't know because he didn't have multiple wives he just had one wife <laughs> 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 but um so all the all these degrees and i can't even handle proper grammar it's the possessive but, it's uh, fine it's confusing <laughs> So her name was Brianna Evans, and Brianna was on the first season of the Titan Game. Yes, she was. She was actually episode one of season one of my podcast last year. Oh, you're kidding. <laughs> no. That's amazing. Yeah. So, so Bri is just like this amazing little stud athlete. Mm -hmm. And I mean, to say little deserves a punch in the face because she is just like a beast when it comes to, I mean, any workout. There's so many things I've worked out with her side by side on certain things. And I'm like, this, this girl's way ahead of me. Um, so she's no joke. So she, um, she competed on season one and I just remember, you know, I was like, wow, 
what, what, what did you do? And she's like, well, we, I can't really say, but you should definitely apply for it. And I was like, okay. So I jumped on, I applied and, um, forgot about it. <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think I applied in 2017, the fall of 2017. I had no idea at this point. Um, totally forgot about it and life went on as normal. And then they called me up at the end of 2019 fall of 2019 and they're like hey you want to be in season two i'm like oh crap um <laughs> yeah um i'm not physically fit but sure let's go like <laughs> but i had to turn i had to turn things around really quick <laughs> yeah um because i was you know just coming off of a couple different strongman meets and you know moving and all of those things i'm like this has been a really rough year but i'm ready let's go <laughs> I love it. So you're just saying yes to the opportunity that comes up. And um, I mean, oh, you I don't say no. You can't say no. Of course not. You can't say no. You say no, it's a show. And it's a, it's a show that was created, of course, by The Rock. I mean, you can't can't say no to that. <laughs> and so, yeah, yeah, right. Right. So, Andrew, then um, I was saying yes and walking through that door of opportunity. It's so cool that you, um, you know, were, became made aware of the show uh, because of Brianna, who was on the show. This is a cool little connection. Um, and so then it brought right. you and catapulted you to season two. And so knowing, yeah. too, like you said, um, not wanting to say no to an incredible opportunity like this and The Rock created this show. Do you have any recollection of maybe when you became aware of who The Rock was in your life or just as, a, as you know, him as a person even before the that you were on the oh, show? Man. Yeah. Um, to be honest. It was probably like sometime fifth grade yeah. or so, um, you know, when like wrestling was at least for my generation, like the big thing to watch. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And I never watched it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I remember seeing a lot of the wrestlers on TV. I just never got into wrestling. And it's kind of funny, actually, I never got into really any professional sports, even today that like that is that's. I mean, even some of my closest friends just want to take my man card away because they're like, how can you not be in sports? And I'm just like, <laughs> eh, I don't really care. Uh, You're kind of busy studying for a lot of, you know, astrophysics and yeah. stuff. So <laughs> I've done a lot of other things. Yeah. Right? Exactly. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I know that that was my first exposure to The Rock. And years and years go by. I don't pay a lot of attention to pop culture. Mm -hmm. I'm like not the person you want me to, uh, you know, you don't want me on your team for pop <laughs> culture trivia night. Like I'm not the guy to have. Um, but, you know, once I got out of the military, I actually got into started using like Instagram as a social media platform just because I never really, I was never big on social media. Mm -hmm. um, some of the, you know, what do they call them recommended people that you follow pop up here and there and i just remember one time like the rock popped up and I'm like oh the rock like what's he up to and so i started following him uh lo and behold like of course you follow on instagram and then all of your ads and all these things start popping up everywhere for like these people or these products or whatever and so he started getting more exposures because well social media uh to Dwayne. yeah and so I started paying attention to like, okay, who is he? Like, okay, besides an actor, he's posting pictures of, of his wife, of his, of his family, um, and just being genuine, you know? So you got YouTube on the other hand, where you can go on and you can look up any modern day speech that's ever given because everything is recorded now <clears throat> and just plastered on the interweb. And yes, I said interweb. Um, <laughs> and so you can go on there. And so you just do that. And so, uh, I just do that at least. And so, you know, I've listened to a lot of his talks, a lot of the um, talks that he gives to professional sports teams or that he's just rambled on. Um, and he, there's just something that's very genuine about him. And when it comes to celebrities, I am like, I'm so quick to be like, no, this person is not like giving us the faith. This is like not the right, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of. Uh, pers not perspective, but they're not giving us the, the real deal, mm -hmm. so to speak. And there was something about Dwayne that was, you know, you could see like, okay, every video, every talk I've heard him on, he is the exact same human individual. You know, he's very genuine. He's authentic. And there's just something about that that you have to, you know, come to appreciate. Um, and that's really, 
where it is like i'm not a huge fanboy of the rock like yeah he's cool mm-hmm. he he does good on on many movies there are many movies that are just t- total blunders um you know and i'm not afraid to call him out yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um but otherwise i mean he's just of of that celebrity kind of group he he definitely stands out above above most of them yeah i would agree and you the tooth fairy is it like an academy award-winning film in your eyes then oh my gosh that's what i mean like why why I mean, okay i understand like he definitely made some money and that's one thing he's really good at is finding the you know the next like money maker but um but yeah there are just some things i'm like no nah, man my standards no nah, i can't do it yeah i got gotcha. you but, but at the know, end of the day i'm sure he had a lot of fun doing it i'm sure and like he never says no you know like he's always in yep. movies and yeah you're right though it's that authentically putting himself out there and then um because of the show that he's yeah. he's created in the titan games obviously it attracts those same kind of authentic p- people of course like yourself leading oh, yeah. these incredible lives and putting yourself out there um and just being able i mean to, i am not to be compared to him though well but it's but it, he it, and you're on a mission that is similar because you are leading that authentic life. And of course, then it calls out all these other Titans and people who um, then could you share the stage with. Right. And you got to You got to compete yeah. with and against. Um, so it's amazing that that, you know, him being that way got to bring all those kinds of people together. And so, Andrew, then right. having that experience and being surrounded by these people and you yourself, of course, um, being one of them, being one of these incredible individuals. What would you say is your definition of a Titan? A definition of a Titan would be probably somebody who just persists, mm-hmm. right? Like this, that non, that, that just relentless attitude that, you know, what I'm doing is not just serving me, but like serving others. And, you know, that's one of the big driving factors behind me. So maybe that's like not the best, but like, <laughs> I guess being a Titan in general right is just that persistence consistency um to to be the best of whatever your your trade or or craft is whether that's physical fitness or taking pictures or you whatever have it teaching children right like trying to be the best at that um i don't really think that there's much more I could say on that. Absolutely, though. I mean, I love it really encompasses everything, right? It's you persist no matter what it is that you do, do mm-hmm. it with all of your heart. And so persist at it, be the best that you can possibly be every single day. Yep. Yeah, 100%. And so, Andrew, now, um, man, you've led such an amazing, amazing life. And it's led you to so many opportunities. And of course, then you had to choose to walk through those doors of opportunity. And you could have let them pass you by, but you didn't. You walked through them um, courageously. And then, of course, getting this um, kind of random opportunity to be on the Titan Games, too, and walking through that door and looking forward, knowing, of course, um, you're going to, if you pursue your PhD, if you pursue whatever it is you're going to pursue next, um, knowing, of course, Mm -hmm. you're going to achieve those goals. Uh, But with all that in mind, I just have have one final question that I ask all of my interviewees what do you want to be remembered for well wow um what do I want to be remembered for and you could have like sent me that question before you know? <laughs> <laughs> the way I was like ready for it <laughs> you know honestly I I don't think I really need to be remembered um yeah. I'm not like you know it's like those the old and I can I can totally liken this um, the the analogy to the Titan Games, but the old kind of Greek uh, saying, you know that you know you, don't you want your name to live on in, in history forever or whatever it might be, something like that, right? Mm-hmm. And I don't really, I don't really need to be remembered for anything as long as you know my family remembers and loves me. <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm happy with that, you know. Thank you all for tuning in to today's installment of the Athletes of the Titan Games podcast. To learn more about each of these Titan athletes, be sure to check out their information in the links in my show notes. Furthermore, to stay up to date on all things coming out of the KMF Collective, be sure to subscribe to the Keep Moving Forward YouTube channel and follow along on social media, also available in the show notes. As the creator of the Titan Games, Mr. Dwayne The Rock Johnson says, Titans aren't born, they're made. 
And I hope today's story helped you realize all that you are capable of becoming if you put in that hard work and just keep moving forward.